In this lecture video, I'm going to be looking at the issue of whistleblowing in business ethics, focusing on the article Dissolving the Moral Dilemma of Whistleblowing by Lars Lindblom. So the definition of whistleblowing that Lindblom offers is that whistleblowing is a deliberate, non-obligatory act of disclosure which gets onto public record and is made by a person who has or had privileged access to data or information of an organization about non-trivial illegality or other wrongdoing, whether actual, suspected, or anticipated, which implicates and is under control of that organization to an external entity having potential to rectify the wrongdoing. So basically, a whistleblower is someone who has some kind of an information on, uh, let's say, a, an organization, whether public or private, that um, exposes the wrongdoing, the actual wrongdoing, which is why it's, it's not simply some trivial kind of information that you expose about, you know, some public, in, or some private information of, of one of the workers, right, that doesn't affect anyone. It has to be actually something the business is doing or the, the, the public organization, um, such that the whistleblower then is alerting the public about, hey, this is this thing going on, the public should be concerned with it. Now, the issue, the issue of whistleblowing is that, you know, usually a whistleblower is someone that is actually involved in the organization. And it seems like there can be this conflict. So we'll look at one side of it first. We've seen what whistleblowing is. Now, the other side is loyalty. So there's loyalty as a moral obligation. And these can concern certain issues like the agency problem. So the kind of loyalty one has to themselves and the kind of uh, uh, beliefs they have, the kind of ideals they have. There can be issues about loyalty with the employee to an employer. So the worker, the kind of loyalty that they have to, to the boss. This is something pretty common, I think, in the sense that, you know, I have a certain loyalty or an obligation such as, you know, um, when I say I can work on Friday, I actually show up when they schedule me to work. Um, in another case, we have loyalty, loyalty from the employer to the employee, such that, uh, you know, the the boss, the owner, uh, they can't just willy nilly, or at least they shouldn't willy nilly decide, hey, you're not going to work today, or I'm just going to fire you for whatever reason, right? There's some kind of an obligation that they have to you as an employer, someone that takes on responsibilities on behalf of that organization. There's also loyalty um, that concerns other kinds of stakeholders, like community members. If we look at stakeholder theory of the corporation, that can involve community members, the other business partners the business works with. It can involve uh, shareholders. It can involve uh, media, the government. Anyone who in some way is related to or is involved as a stakeholder to that organization. There's also loyalty that not merely is a moral obligation, so how we ought to behave, but how legally, if we don't, right, we can be punished. So there are certain kinds of contractual obligations in a loyal sense, such that I, um, you know, if I sign a contract uh, uh, to work for someone and they give me trade secrets, um, right, that, that, that pertains to how they make the very product they, they sell, I can't just run to another kind of a business and give them all those trade secrets such that then they can just make the product that the other company had in the first place. So loyalty to the organization, according to Lindblom, can be understood as a positive concern for the firm, if not full identification with it, such that if I am an employee of the organization, if I'm a member of that organization, in some way, I am like a part of it, right? That when I act, I act on behalf of the organization. I act as if I'm responsible in a way for what happens to the organization because as a, basically uh, an appendage of that organization, right? I have to identify myself to some extent or another with that organization. Now this can mean the kinds of loyalties we have might be greater or lesser, but there's definitely some kind of a loyalty I have to an organization I'm involved with, no matter what kind of an organization that is. Here's where the moral dilemma, though, arises. So we've seen that we have certain kinds of moral obligations. Consider this scenario, uh, the first one. 
So you've learned that somebody is planning to dump toxic waste in a lake not far from where you live. This information is not public. What would you do? Well, probably the clear response would be to alert the authorities or talk to the press. Now, why? Well, you have a certain kind of freedom of speech, right? You don't work for that company, so you are going to be affected by this or you, you, you just don't like that other people are going to be affected by this toxic waste being dumped into the lake. So what do you do? You alert the authorities. You, you go to uh, uh, the government. You go to um, some kind of a, a journalist who maybe is going to publish a story about this because you want that action to be stopped uh, for whatever reason. Now, scenario two, you've learned that your company is planning to dump toxic waste in a lake not far from where you live. This information is not public. What would you do? Well, if your reason is loyalty to company, then you do not alert the authorities or the press. Now, this might seem extreme, right? Because you might say, well, well, who in the world is going to not alert the, author alert the authorities or the press when your company is dumping toxic waste in a lake, right? I mean, it's like saying, um, if I knew that my son was going to go to school and, and try to shoot up the school, I, I, I'm sorry, like, you know, I have a certain kind of loyalty to my son, but I should do um, whatever's required to stop my son from, from doing that, right? Like, there's a certain uh, a threshold where what is the right thing to do trumps the kind of loyalties you have. So we might clearly say in scenario two, that's not a good reason loyalty to company. But what about other things that aren't as you know, clearly uh, 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 bad as dumping toxic waste in a lake? What about a situation where um, maybe a company is you know, hiding a bit of money um, from taxes, it's not paying its taxes, and it's using that money to actually pay its workers a little bit more. So it's doing something illegal, but you're actually benefiting from it. Should you alert the authorities or talk to the press? Right? And let's say that tax money, you know, this isn't really how it works, but let's say if that company were paying the, the taxes it's supposed to, it would go to, um, uh, uh, you know, sheltering the homeless such that with that extra tax money, we could do something such that uh, we could address the homelessness problem. As a worker, do you have a certain kind of loyalty to the company such that the company is raising the salaries of everyone else and you're benefiting so as a member of that company, it seems like, you know, you would be almost going against yourself uh, if you're going to alert the authorities about this situation. But we might also say, well, uh, to some extent, you know, even if I'm not affected by it, it's still wrong that this other kind of uh, social benefit isn't being realized because of what the company's doing. And in this way, uh, I have a certain kind of responsibility, a kind of loyalty to the public as a citizen. But what if that means the company, you know, who's already struggling um, is going to close and everyone's going to lose their jobs, right? Don't you have a loyalty to the company to keep it surviving? I mean, as a worker, you want the company to do well, right? At least the, the sense is if, the, if it does well, then you should do well. That's not always the case, right? So we have, according to Lindblom, this dilemma that results where we have the right to political free speech that comes into conflict with the duty of loyalty to an organization where one works. Now, Lynn Blum is going to try to show, actually, there is no such dilemma. And first, he's going to appeal to the value of free political speech, and he's going to try to explain what that is. So he says that there are three central arguments for the value of free speech. We have the right to autonomy, that if I am the owner of my own body, then I get to decide what I do with my body, and part of my body is the, the voice I make, right? So I get to say what I want to say, that I have the right to free speech because I have the right to, to bodily autonomy. The second argument for free speech is there are epistemological benefits. So this is found um, in uh, John Stuart Mill, for example, and this idea that through everyone kind of, this is, you know, typically people talk about like the marketplace of ideas, um, but this idea is that uh, if everyone is able to bring their different perspectives to the table, that through discussing and debating those different ideas, we end up progressing as a whole because if other people had uh, were censored over what they could and could not say, there are all kinds of other 
truths that might not emerge because those are censored. So actually, free speech is better overall in the long run. And the third central argument for the value of free speech is that free speech is a fundamental uh, a democratic value, and it plays this fundamental role in a democratic society. Glenn Blum says, It is a precondition for democracy, it concerns centrally political speech, and it can only under very particular circumstances be restricted. So if we are to value democracy, um, then it's clear, and this is actually the kind of uh, value of free speech that Lynn Blum is going to focus on, it's clear then that uh, it is a good that we have a right to a free speech and we ought to say that uh, we uphold it. Now, we can also ask, though, um, is the information that whistleblowers generally make political speech? Right? Because you, you can't just go out there and slander someone else. You know, libel laws, you can be um, uh, you know, arrested for that. So if is the kind of activity that whistleblowers engage in the kind of speech that would be protected, the kind of speech that, that, that um, is, is required for this fundamentally uh, uh, democratic role. Now, if it concerns harm as widely defined, then Lindblom says yes. If whistleblowers are exposing harm, then it is political speech. Now, it, it can't merely be harm in the sense of uh, like physical harm, because one, you can say a company is harming another company, but clearly companies aren't physically harmed, right? We mean that in a, a different sense. So Lindblom says, if we're going to say the kind of speech that whistleblowers are engaged in um, is that which concerns harm, and that's why it's political speech, then it has to be, what we mean by harm is in a wider, more general sense. So whistleblowing concerns situations where organizations are in a position to do harm to the public. That means not just a harm to everyone, but anyone who's a member of that public. We need a theory of justice uh, to know whether or not then it, it, it is right to privilege the freedom of speech over the loyalty to an organization. The kind of theory of justice that Lynn Blum appeals to is Rawls's contractualism. So according to John Rawls's two principles of justice, we have first, um, the, the one that is actually uh, prioritized over the second, the first one, the liberty principle, that each person has the same indefeasibly, uh, indefeasible claim to a fully adequate scheme of equal basic liberties, which scheme is compatible with the same scheme of liberties for all. So this means that everyone, if there's any some kind of liberty that someone enjoys, it has to be equally shared by all in all circumstances, such that it can't be the case that in one circumstance, if I'm a politician, I have more free speech than other people who aren't politicians, right? Because in that way, we give more rights to some and less to others. So if there is to be a right or liberty, it has to be something that uh, is compatible with everyone else also sharing uh, that right or liberty. And secondly, this is known as the difference principle, that social and economical inequalities are to satisfy two conditions. First, they are to be attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. And second, they are to be to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. So that means even if someone is a worker in a company, they still have that kind of uh, equal status as a citizen that is granted the same right of freedom of speech that anyone else gets. Therefore, according to the two principles of justice, there is no moral dilemma of whistleblowing. Lynn Blum says, The freedom of association gives individuals rights to form associations as well as rights to enter into and exist from them, but it does not give associations rights over their members. So the right as a citizen trumps the right um, that one that a business might have in regard to its uh, relationship to its employees, such that the, the, the kind of loyalty that one has to a business never trumps the more basic right of freedom of speech. So one always, one always has a moral right to uh, be a whistleblower. Now this does not mean though that uh, being a whistleblower doesn't come with its costs. Oftentimes, if you're a whistleblower, you probably lose your job, you can face jail time, 
Uh, you can face scrutiny. There can be intense, uh, intense, you know, uh, uh, private problems for the person who is a whistleblower. So it's no easy thing to be a whistleblower. So what I want to do is actually look at some cases of whistleblowing. This first case is Peter Buxton. So this is the whistleblower whose actions led to the ending of the infamous experiment, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. It was uh, done by government doctors to study the progression of the venereal disease in African-American men. Basically, what they were doing was injecting uh, black men with syphilis. And the black men didn't know that they were being injected with syphilis. Uh, so Buxton exposed this to the public. So he was a former employee of the United States Public Health Service, and he was shocked to discover that as part of a long-term study, the PHS had told about 400 black men with syphilis that they had bad blood. When funding was cut, the study deliberately went forward without therapy for decades, even when penicillin was found to be an effective treatment. In 1972, Buxton leaked information on the Tuskegee experiment to a Washington Star reporter. The story became front page news and led to congressional hearings. The second case I want to look at is Jeffrey Wigand. So he was the former head of research and development at the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation, a company that manuf manufactured cigarettes and snuff. Wigand became nationally known as a whistleblower in February 1996 when he appeared on the CBS news program 60 Minutes and said that higher-ups at Brown and Williamson had knowingly approved additives to their cigarettes that were known to cause cancer and to be addictive. So we have here the case of tobacco companies doing things to their cigarettes that they know makes people addicted to their cigarettes and that causes cancer. And uh, an executive let the public know, yeah, the tobacco companies were actually doing this. So to what extent is Wigand actually a, um, you know, a hero? Because he was involved with what these tobacco companies were doing, but he also alerted the public about it. So it's perhaps mixed in this case. Then we have the case of Chelsea Manning. And this is a clear case where there are uh, repercussions for being a whistleblower. So, Chelsea Manning was a U.S. Army soldier who passed to WikiLeaks in 2010 thousands of pages of military-related documents. The disclosures included videos of a July 12, 2007 Baghdad airstrike and a 2009 airstrike in Afghanistan and U.S. diplomatic cable and army reports that came to be known as the Iraq War Logs and the Afghan War Diary. In news reports, Manning said she released the documents to show the true cost of war. I mean, what was going on was people in these, for example, helicopters were acting like they were playing video games, just killing random people. All other kinds of atrocities like this were being committed that the, the U.S. Army was covering up. And, you know, the, 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 the higher ups weren't doing anything about it. So Chelsea Manning decided, I'm going to have to go to WikiLeaks, go to Julian Assange, and the public has to know about what's going on. Well, what happened? Chelsea Manning was put in prison. Uh, Julian Assange is in prison still, actually trying to in the UK, trying to be extradited to the United States. There's a whole issue about press freedom if he if he's going to be tried because it would it would basically say that any time a journalist uh, reports on information that might be classified, you know, they're subject to um, prison time, etc. Um, so there are real issues with this case that's still ongoing. Um, but basically, uh, so Manning was court-martialed in July 2013 and ordered to serve 35 years. But in January 2017, President Barack Obama commuted all but four months of her remaining sentence. And so uh, now she's no longer in prison. But again, Julian Assange, who did publish these documents, uh, is in prison. A similar case would be Edward Snowden, who um, notified the public about the NSA spying uh, on its citizens and and. and other persons you know around the world and he had to flee the united states because they were going to put him in prison and he currently uh has been given asylum in russia now one case that i did want to mention uh is claire patterson so this person borders the line of whether we can call them a whistleblower so they didn't 
work for the organization that they were trying to expose. Um, and the information wasn't necessarily secret once um, he made it public. I think, nonetheless, he can still be considered a whistleblower, but it's not as clear-cut as the three previous cases. But this, for for me, this is, when I heard about this story, this is something that I'll never forget. So basically, Claire Patterson was someone who um, was a scientist, and they realized there's lead everywhere. That even in when they were in, in a scientific lab, they were getting readings of lead when they're trying to study uranium and other other kinds of minerals. And they're like, you know, he, he was wondering, where's all this lead coming from? So he traveled the world by land, air, and sea to collect environmental samples from surface water, deep water, marine sediment, snow-capped peaks, Arctic and Antarctic ice, and even Peruvian and Egyptian mummies, only to discover that the planet had become one big ball of lead. Its concentration in the atmosphere was more than 1,000 times above natural levels and 100 times in the human body itself, a figure he later corrected to 600 times. Where was this coming from? Gasoline. The oil companies were using leaded gas, and they were trying to cover up the effects that this leaded gas was having on every single living being in the world. Patterson, once he realized this and tried to alert the public, was ignored and ridicule, ridiculed for years until finally in 1976, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, as a precaution, mandated a reduction in the levels of lead and gasoline, which were incompatible with the new catalytic converters designed to lower particle emissions. But it wasn't even until the 1980s that Patterson's work was accepted and his data recognized. So, 1986 marked the beginning of the end of leaded gasoline, which disappeared from all filling stations in the U.S. on December 35th, 1995. Weeks after, an asthma attack ended Patterson's life. Since then, as prohibitions on leaded gasoline spread across the globe, lead levels in the atmosphere, the environments, and the human body have fallen dramatically, especially in high-income countries. But... The, the story is, you know, part of the story that's so fascinating is Patterson tries to alert the public about this. So what do the, the, the oil companies do? They hire another scientist to go out there and, and make up these bogus studies for why Patterson is wrong. Then that wasn't working. So what do they do? They try and buy Patterson off. They try and give him money to shut up, to not let the public know what's going on. I mean, this is very similar to, um, I believe it was uh, ExxonMobil in the 70s. They did a study about uh, the emissions of, um, uh, uh, of, of oil, right, the carbon emissions, to see what would be effects in the future. The scientists came back and were like, hey, uh, basically, you're going to warm up the planet. You're going to uh, destabilize the climate. So what did ExxonMobil do? Fired all the scientists tried to destroy the evidence so no one could know, actually, all this gasoline that we rely on is going to destroy human civilization in the future. Um, now, that there wasn't a case of whistleblowing in that case because we didn't find out about that until recently in emails that were leaked. Um, and by then, you know, the science behind climate change was, it, it was known. Um, but it's a, similar, it's a similar case where these big corporations, right, they know what they're doing is having a detrimental effect on human beings and yet it doesn't matter because they prioritize profit over human lives. This is why whistleblowing is so important. Now, many companies try now to sponsor ethics hotlines where they say, hey, if there's a problem, uh, call this number and, uh, you know, in, in the business, we want to take care of it ourselves, right? Because it's clearly harmful for the business if the public finds out about this information. So if there are things that are going on uh, in the company that an employee recognizes is not ethical, the company wants to be able to resolve that issue itself. So they sponsor these ethics hotlines that employees can um, uh, use. A question we might have about this is whether they're helpful in creating ethically responsible, uh, socially responsible organizations. Do they actually help 
combat against these issues that whistleblowers um, are, are important for. And could these ethics hotlines ever actually be harmful? Are there ways that maybe just the existence of the ethics hotline makes workers think that, you know, well, if I call and uh, report this issue, it'll be resolved. Do workers know if it actually ever is resolved? Does it deter whistleblowing? Certain things to think about.